All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Jay's Analysis. Today, uh, we have a good friend of mine, a guy that I met uh, a few years ago who um, has had a pretty big impact on me. Really awesome guy. I've been around multiple times in person, and that is Father Moses McPherson. And he's going to join me today to talk about some of the topics and controversies that have popped up in the last few years, particularly with the issue of who has the authority to teach? Where does that qualification come from? Is it just an academic thing? Is there also kind of a spiritual purification process uh, that's needed to be a teacher? Should we get our theology from Twitter? Should we go to random anonymous experts on Twitter? Uh, is there a danger of creating a kind of online spurgery through thinking that orthodoxy is primarily or, or perhaps essentially some sort of intellectual academic thing. And Father Moses, of course, has been a priest for many years, so he has a lot of experience that he can speak to on this issue. Father Moses, thank you for coming on. Hey, Jay, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, so let's get into it right away. Um, maybe if you're if you're comfortable, uh, you know, if you want to talk about maybe a little bit of your own experience uh, coming into the priesthood, how you decided and discerned that that was right for you, and maybe how you learned to take it a little slower than a lot of people want to kind of do. We want to, and I'm guilty of this too, I've wanted to kind of jump into the, the heavy theology right away and immediately start telling everybody what's right and what's wrong, and uh, I've kind of had to back down a little bit from some of those mistakes in my own life, so where do we need to start with this issue? What's your own experience? Yeah, I would say, you know, in terms of my own experience, you know, I did kind of the normal path to the priesthood. So I was uh, more or less, I was in my third year of undergraduate when I first got exposed to orthodoxy. So pretty standard, started going to church, started attending services, uh, kind of began the catechumen process, which for me lasted um, kind of a, maybe a bit over a year when you, when you look at the whole thing, um, uh, finished up my degree, uh, was Orthodox at basically 25. And uh, when we came into the church, I mean, the biggest thing I would say is that I had, you know, an undergrad degree in philosophy and religion. I had done a double major and I had been so inundated with um, kind of that academic culture for so long that orthodoxy was, was a real break from that in a lot of ways. It wasn't that there wasn't intellectual writing, but, and, and I shared this with you before, when I came into the faith, I remember, you know, going to the uh, monastery bookstore, St. Barbara's in Southern California, and talking, and talking to the nuns about, you know, theological books. And they were like, well, why would you buy theological books? And I'm like, oh, well, you know, I got to understand orthodoxy and all this. And they were like, you're not at that level. Like you're, you're, a, you know, like you're a catechumen. And so I picked up a couple of books at the time that are to this day, you know, it's been eight, 18 years, I think yesterday, since we were brought into the church. Um, so almost half my life. Uh, which were St. Joseph the Hezekast and St. Silouan. And I mean, both of those books are full of theology, but just not in a way that I had thought about it. And so I originally started that journey of just emulating what they were doing, you know, saying the Jesus prayer. I often tell people when I first started, I would be doing, you know, 33 Jesus prayers. And I thought I was like, pulling teeth out of my head, you know, just to sit and do prayers. And I mean, I was, you know, <laughs> academically, whatever, uh, rigorous and writing 10 page papers and doing all this stuff. And, and I went to a very academically challenging undergraduate school. And yet, here I am with this little prayer rope, like just killing myself. And uh, the biggest thing for me, you know, when we went to the church, we, we, the closest church was, was a Greek church. And so, when we went there, the priest said, he goes, look, you already know more than like anybody in this church. Okay. And he's like, that's not what I need. He's like, I just need you to show up and come to services. So originally it was all about praying, uh, fasting, going to services, just being at liturgy, like every single Sunday, 
Uh, I worked Saturday night, so that wasn't an option. And our church really didn't have Vespers very often. And so it was really that grind for two, two and a half years, almost three years um, before seminary even came on the map. And, you know, after I was brought into the church, I asked the priest, I said, you know, I've never served in the altar and uh, I would love to do that. You know, like I was never an altar boy growing up. Right. But I said, I'd love to serve in the altar if you're okay with that. And he was like, great, come serve in the altar. So when I was serving in the altar, it was, I had one real interesting conversation with him, but I, I, I felt a distinct draw, like a very intense draw to serving the liturgy. And I remember I talked to my priest and I said, you know, I feel this draw to serve the liturgy. And he's like, he like rebuked me. He, he was like, why? So you can stand in front of everybody and be the center of attention. And I was like, no, I, I just, I don't care if anybody's there. I, I just want to serve the liturgy. And he was like, okay. <laughs> and it was like, you know, he had like a, like a, so it's sort of a vetting, a testing kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, what's this about? Is this for you or is this for everybody else? Like, what? where is this calling from? Because, and I'll be honest with you, a lot of times, and I've known lots of guys, obviously, who've entered the priesthood or seminary, and I hate to say it, but there's a lot of times it's a real temptation for our own selves to say, wow, this gives me meaning or this gives me purpose or whatever else. And that's not the, that's not the priesthood. The priesthood isn't for you. The priesthood is for everybody else. And so after, you know, I had been Orthodox almost three years at the time, I had developed a very uh, strong relationship with the abbess of the monastery and with my priest. And that's kind of, I was at a crux. I was almost 30 years old. I was like 29. And I had to make a decision if I was going to go back and do an MBA or do something else, or I was going to go to seminary. Uh, I, I don't think being Orthodox for three years is sufficient. I really wish I had been Orthodox more like probably five years, but at the time I had been married for almost 10 years. So it wasn't like, it wasn't like I was a newlywed or something else or like, you know, I had almost 10 years of marriage because I got married young. I, I knew my priest very well. He knew me in and out. I had a relationship with, with this abbess of the monastery and and I had read enough in the fathers about the priesthood that I'll be honest with you, I really didn't want to become a priest. I actually, it was, it was a con. I remember telling somebody this years ago and they got scandalized and, and another priest told me, oh, you can't tell people that. I'm like, that's the truth. I had read the desert fathers. I had read other saints and they did not want to be ordained and they didn't want to be ordained because of the judgment. And so at the time, it was other people talking to me and saying, you know, this is like, we think that this is the direction for you. And I was like, maybe when I'm in my 40s, I would say that, like, maybe when I'm in my 40s, I'll go do this or later on or blah, blah, blah. And I had a series of distinct events that happened in conversations. And, and long story short is that um, it basically you know, was confirmed by my priest. I talked to my spiritual mother. I'm like, do I have your blessing? Is this good? And she gave me her blessing, which to me, that was, you know, my priest and my spiritual mother was like, and, and, and I say he was my priest because he was, he wasn't really a spiritual father for me, although I had a good relationship with him. A spiritual father is something distinct and we can talk about that. But for her, I had a very, a very, um, um, a very strong relationship and a relationship built on talking about prayer and spiritual development. So and, uh, let me ask you a yeah. question about that, because is that because we oftentimes might not know where that desire is originating from, right? It could be from our own hearts. It could be the suggestion of a spirit that we don't know, a malicious spirit. It might be a real, you know, motivation coming from God. So is the reason for that, that we, we don't always immediately know our own hearts and our own motivations. And so it needs to be kind of batted around with other more advanced spiritual people to help discern. Is that kind of what's going on? Yeah. I don't know why I got a thumbs down there, but, um, it, what's yeah what i was gonna say is that's a, that's 100 percent it 
we don't, I mean, honestly, the number one red flag is somewhere. In that, the that wasn't me, by the way. I don't know where that came from. I don't know if it's. Well, it, it comes from the hand gesture. So um, what I was going to say is the number one red flag is when somebody says, I feel called to be a priest. That is the number one red flag. Now, that doesn't mean that they aren't called to be a priest. It's a red flag. It means it has to be uncovered. Like you said, it has to be discerned. And for me, I didn't really want to be a priest. I felt a draw. I could say it was very distinct when I was in the liturgy. I felt a draw, but I didn't want to be a priest. I didn't want all the responsibilities and everything else. Uh, that's why the confirmation is so important. I mean, people would never, in the, when you look at the Desert Fathers, if a Desert Father found out that they were going to make him a priest, many times they would cut off a part of their ear. And they did this because then they couldn't get ordained. Mm. They were so, they were so afraid of being ordained. And so my formation in reading the saints was that there was like a real fear and it got, it got put inside of me. And um, when that happened, you know, I needed the confirmation. I needed discernment from other people. So when I had the blessing, uh, that's when I started to make application and, and go through this whole process. And it's kind of a big story, but the long story short is, and this has happened several times in my life, every single door opened. I, I like every door opened in a totally miraculous fashion. And I literally called St. Tecons and I was like, did I get accepted? And they were like, oh yeah. And it was like, a, it was like a month before school started or something. Okay. And I was like, they're like, yeah, we sent you a letter. And I'm thinking like, why wouldn't you call me? You know, like this is crazy. So that was like, that was a red flag right there. Like no administrative stuff. So I was like, okay. I immediately said, we've got X, Y, and Z to sell. And literally every single thing we needed to sell, somebody came and bought like, like, like a car, we had a brand new bed that somebody in need needed and we were able to give it to them for a great price. There was like just all kinds, of, anyways. And then on the other side, we needed a place to live. And I, they said, here is a contact for one of the seminarians who will help you find housing. So I called and he goes, hey, we got this place. It's literally two miles from the seminary, fully furnished. Do you want it? I'm like, yeah. So that was it. Like in like in a week, we had like sold everything. Yeah. Had a place to go. And then we like literally left and drove cross country and ended up at this place, you know, September first or whatever. And school started September 5th. But it was it was wild. Like everything in our life changed in like three weeks. Um again, that's one of those things that I've seen. You we oftentimes when people ask me how to pray, I'm like, pray that God would close the wrong doors. Because God will close doors. When doors open and, and there's like multiple doors and the seeming impossible happens, that's when you start to go, God is with this. You know what I mean? Um, and, 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 I, and I will say this too, which was a big part of it was that we had traveled up to San Francisco and we had prayed before the relics of St. John Maximovich, which my second son is named after him. Um, but there was, there, there was just... There were so many things and so many confirmations. Um, so we ended up there. So we've been Orthodox, you know, for a little over two and a half years of being in the church. So really three and a half, if you look at it with the catechism. Um, and then I was in seminary for three years. And, you know, seminary, at least at St. Tecons, was not very academically challenging. I mean, it was nothing compared to my undergraduate. You know, I went to a Dutch neo-Calvinist undergraduate program that was very like a European education. It was very intense. Uh, and St. Tecons was nothing like that. But what St. Tecons was, was services. And it was the first time I got to immerse myself in the life of the church that I had never done before. So I was able to go to liturgy three days a week and go to vigil three, four days a week and or Vespers and just, and just be in the services all the time praying and then having a priest there hearing my confession. I started going to confession all the time, you know? Um, and, and the thing was, is that the spiritual formation was not, 
in the classroom. The spiritual formation was really in confession and in the church and the amount of time I spent in confession. I mean, I, you know, when we first started there, I just felt like there was all this stuff coming out of me. And it was like just being in church, just the grace of being in church was like drawing out all this stuff. Um, you know, I, I honestly, there was a lot about orthodoxy that I came to realize, like, even though I thought I had read quite a bit, like I had no idea. And over three, and it's funny because I've been a priest for 10 years and I go, dude, what I know now after 10 years versus the first even couple of years is like, seems like night and day. You know, there's so much to read across so many different time periods and so many different cultures and different uh, like, um, um, like schools of thought on things. Not, not, not that they aren't harmonious because they are, but just they're, they're different. They're different perspectives. Um, Russian spirituality in some ways is very different than Greek spirituality. There, there, there's, there, are, there are marked differences. Um, so anyways, after three years of seminary, I, I graduated. Uh, they had my ordination. I, I graduated on a Saturday. They had my ordination to the diaconate for that Monday. Uh, so I was ordained on a Monday after I graduated. And the, I mean, it's a pretty funny story, but we went to lunch with all the bishops and there were like, I think three metropolitans and three bishops at my ordination because it was a big, it was the big liturgy. They just kind of threw me in there and, you know, I'm sitting at lunch and I've got like my riasa on with the big sleeves and I'm like trying to eat and like, I just like, just don't want to get noticed, you know? And, uh, the whole day is like very overwhelming, you know, to become ordained. It's, it's, it's an overwhelming event. And, uh, and then one of the bishops says, Hey, I'm going to ordain you to the priesthood. And my bishop said, you know, well, we got to get the Metropolitan's blessing. And the Metropolitan said, well, he's already, or he's already graduated. So he doesn't need my blessing. And so he said, he just turned to me and said, I'll ordain you this Sunday. So I was like, this was like a Monday. So I was like sitting there. I had just learned how to be a deacon. Like I had been studying. I knew nothing about being a priest liturgically, like mm. the movements, like mm -hmm. any. And uh, so then I'm like, I'm sitting there and I'm like eating. And then I'm like, I turn to him like, just to confirm Vladika, because like my mom will probably want to come out. I'm like, yeah, you're ordaining me this Sunday. He's like, yeah. I'm like, do you know where? He's like, now nah, we'll find it. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, so yeah. did you have more point there? Go ahead. No, I, I got it. a question. Yeah. So one thing you mentioned a minute ago, and this is important to this discussion is the academic side of it, right? Because def definitely the academic stuff has a place, but it can also become a kind of an idol and it can become the replacement instead of knowing and trying to have a relationship with God. We can instead worship and have a relationship with this idea that we have and that's not god that's the idea of god so what is the uh, uh, accurate place for academics in this domain now, you had a good discussion about saint gregory palamas that he was chosen because he kind of had both qualities right of mm -hmm. the logic and the philosophy as well as the theology what is the right place of academia for us i, I, I the one thing i would say is it's very hard that to study theology without a very intense prayer life. If you can't be in the services, like I see the ideal is to be a monastic in this regard. And it does just reality. But if you can't be a monastic, I remember Father Roman Braga, blessed memory, a saint. Um, he was in Michigan. You know, he came over from Romania. And Father Roman used to say, I send anybody to St. Tikhon's because they have a monastery. And he said, in Romania, we had the monastery and the seminary together. Mm -hmm. So we always went to services, we chanted, we did everything with the monks, and we studied at the same time. So even though, yes, we're married, that's a reality. We're not going to be monastics. The formation has to be one. And I heard this so many times, the priest must have the heart of a monk. Like he has to have that heart inside of him that he, he could very easily just leave the world and go be a man of prayer. That's where the heart has to be. Uh, so it has to be cultivated. And we could say the same thing. We're super blessed in America to have Jordanville. 
which I think is the is by far the best seminary. And what is it? Men get to go there and actually live as almost uh, uh, monastics. They they live as as basically um, uh, 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 in, not inquire. What's the word I'm looking for? But they're yeah, we, we've had. I know what you mean. That they get to live the cycle of the services where the the theology and the academic stuff isn't divorced from from that cycle. <coughs> Cycle the light yeah. of the church, like you were talking about, uh, like Luke Luke Kendrat, you know, he went to Jordanville and he talked about that. Yeah, because the thing is, is you're 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 actively purifying. You know, we see God not with our mind. That this is a, this is the distinction between east and west, which is we don't see God with our mind. We see yeah. God with the heart, with the purified noose, right? And so when you're in the services, you are actively purifying your noose. You are turning all of the attention of your heart to prayer. Even if you're just standing in church doing the Jesus prayer the whole time, you know, for an hour or two, it doesn't matter. You're still turning your being towards God. So then when you go to the books and you're reading, you know the God that you're reading about because it's the same God you spent two hours with earlier that day. You are in you're in relationship with him. You're not just reading, like you said, about somebody that you've heard about. You're you're. You're, and, 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 and if you're communing, I mean, you are ingesting him, you know, you are, you are actively receiving Christ into yourself as you're learning about him. Um, you know, so, so many times I remember, I remember a good example, right. Which was, you know, that the, that the Holy fathers, when they talk about the Trinity, this is a very hard concept for people to understand. It's not just that they said, oh, the Trinity is in scripture. It's all, it's that they could see the Trinity noetically they could see the godhead noetically mystically i remember i was talking with a priest one time and he said father when i was serving the liturgy i felt like i was looking into heaven and mm -hmm. i could see the godhead he wasn't saying literally with his eyes he was saying noetically mm -hmm. he said he, that there were three persons and they were one in essence now what does that mean because we say these kind of you know, grand theological statements, but they're only like one sentence long. It's like, you know, um, Elder Sophroni talked about like, like we read scripture and scripture only gives us an outline of what happened. It doesn't go into much detail. Like for instance, Christ on Mount Tabor, he was transfigured and became all light. Well, what does that mean? You don't know it until you see it. You know, we, the, the theology is, is, you know, our, our finite language trying to capture that which is infinite. And so many times the Holy Fathers say, like when you start reading Hezekastic Fathers, they say these things about God, like, you know, that God be consumed them. What does that mean? Like, that's it. They just say, God, I was consumed in prayer by the Lord, you know, the living God or something. Uh, so, <coughs> excuse me. But yeah, I mean, you, you have to be in that purification process for the theology to be really sinking in. And, and it wasn't that uh, St. Tikhon's had, you know, um, a subpar education. It wasn't that. It just, it was a whole life. It was a whole lifestyle. That's what it was. It was, it was yeah. holistic in a way that Western academics is very divorced. And it's, and it's just the classroom and none of the heart. So I'm, I think, I'm trying to think of an analogy like, It'd be like reading all about medicine and knowing everything about medicine, but not taking yeah. the medicine. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll would be silly. Thing, and it's like, how many guys are these weightlifting exercise physiologist guys, PhD? And you look at them and you're like, have you even lifted weights? Yeah. yeah. You, have some, some... you have some guy who's, who's huge, red face, high blood pressure, whatever else has never been to school like graduated high school maybe and he can help people get strong as an ox it's like why because he has all experience and the experience has imparted the knowledge and and maybe he's studied and read i mean the greatest powerlifting coach ever louis simmons he read all of these russian texts but i don't think he even had a college degree i don't even know if he graduated high school but he lived it and then he studied at the same time that he was living it and so he was able to hand it on he created more work than anything else. I mean, like, that's how the, yeah, yeah anyways. Yeah, well, so um, you mentioned, you know, that 
so academia has a place uh it can be an idol what is that proper place when it comes to you know say uh, uh you know a lot of good academics that are orthodox out there that i know that that do live the faith you know dr bo branson or like a dr david bradshaw and and th- they're not priests uh you know they're they're professors that that bring their, uh, you know, their theology into their life and into their, their classroom. Cause they, you know, they specialize in certain topics. So what's that right balance for the person who's not like, a you know, a priest or a deacon even who's, who's just a lay, but they're an academic, so to speak. Well, I mean, I think that I would draw the distinction between the fact that, that they're like, we would say they're like, prof- they're professionals. You know what I mean? And so I think the distinction becomes that there are people who are lay people who think that all their problems are academic and they're not, their problems are really interpersonal and their real problems in their life are, are spiritual. They have real spiritual problems that they need to address, but they think if they read academic books, it's going to somehow help them. And it's not, you know, I, I, um, yeah. We, well, I'm, like, no, I mean, I, those are friends of ours and people that, you know, we know in our circles that are professors that live their Orthodox faith out. Mm-hmm. And I'm just saying that, you know, they're not priests, they're not deacons, they're, they're lay professors. Um, but then there's other types of people who, for example, um, will have no academic training at all, but then present themselves as a kind of academic expert on Twitter. And there's, but there's also people that present themselves as spiritual fathers, the elders of Twitter, right? I know there's a joke profile that says that, but I'm talking about people who actually think that they're sort of spiritual guides on Twitter or something like that. So it's like two different types of error. One presenting themselves as an academic and they're not. Uh, another type that's an academic and openly subverts the faith, you know, the sort of Fordham type people. Uh, and then the other people who present themselves as, oh, I don't care about academics. I'm spiritually advanced and let me show you how I pray publicly on Twitter. It's different flavors is what I'm getting at here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're talking about the two heirs. One of them is people who are guru types and the other ones that are academic types. Is that, would that be fair? I mean, right. But saying. I mean, but what I'm saying is, is that there are certain people in, in our spheres of orthodoxy online mm-hmm. that don't have any credentials or a blessing or approval at all and they fall into two camps one camp says that they're just gurus and they don't need the intellectual stuff another camp is intellectuals who might be oh. and then they say well i don't need any of the the i don't care what the church says i'm an and I'm, I'm an academic so i'm just saying different sort of flavors of a, of a similar problem at root yeah i mean i mean and i think you already said which is it's self-appointed Right. It's somebody it's somebody who, you know, when we peel back the layers of the onion, it's just ego. It's just egotism, you know. It's, so in, in your mind, what's the what are the key? Well, like what would you what are the red flags, I guess, is what we should look out for. here. What, what, what red flags would you say? Because some people let me give you an example. That's a common objection or question that I hear. I'm in another country where there's not a lot of orthodoxy. Maybe I'm in a Roman Catholic country, so I don't have an easy access to, you know, orthodox people. I'm online. I see uh, all these different people talking about orthodoxy. How do I know who's right without, you know, kind of looking at, and and so are there red flags we could look for, for kind of like, you know, maybe this is somebody to avoid. Yeah. I mean, so number one is like, we want to stick with institutions that are trusted. Obviously I'm in Rocor. So for us, we have, uh, you know, our seminary of the Midwest. So we have, professors that are chosen out that can teach those courses you any lay person with the blessing of their priest can take a class from that seminary or do a catechism right so there's there is a hierarchical blessing uh, uh, your priest blessing is i would say more of a, a kind of concept i don't you know having a priest blessing is not the same as a hierarchs right because every priest receives his blessing from the hierarch to teach and to be, and to hear confessions and be a spiritual father Um, or, you know, to hear confessions. I mean, being a spiritual father is part of that for some people, but you know what I'm saying? Uh, The point is, is that when we have people online, they're, they're all self-appointed. So even when people say, well, my priest gave me this blessing, 
It's like, let's talk about what's normal in the church. What's normal in the church is I was raised in the church till my late twenties. I was married. I had children. I went away to seminary, <coughs> did some kind of formation for three years. Then I was ordained. And then I was a priest in my early thirties. That's it. That's the only norm that we have. Somebody like me, who's a convert, who was only Orthodox for two and a half ish years. That's a new territory because everybody grew up in the faith. So people had basically 28, 29 years of formation in the church services with a spiritual father. That was the only path. There's no, there's no other historical path. Now somebody says, well, can't there be spiritual fathers who are not priests? One, they're super rare. And two, they're basically all monastics. We don't have a bunch of lay people who are spiritual fathers or spiritual guides or psychologists. All of this stuff is, is Western culture being grafted onto the church. It's why, you know, St. Sophroni said, he's like, I, I could read the quote, but he basically says, why would you go to a psychologist? He's like, you have a priest. He's like, go to the priest. They have the grace of the priesthood. They can forgive your sins and they can direct you by the Holy Spirit. So the idea that somebody who doesn't have ordination, doesn't have a formation, and has only been Orthodox for, you know, sub five years or something, is qualified in any way to guide anyone else's life is completely foreign. There, the yeah, I, I think that's the essence of it. So it's sort of like when you say formation, this is both the spiritual purification process, learning to pray, and at least some degree of theological education, which includes academia. So it's like, yeah, it's not, it's just, it's just not separating these parts and having a part of it. Right. Well, and we've had a real problem in the church with un, uneducated priests. Well, that's what and I was going to ask about the theological education, because a lot of people who will well, say, if you bring this topic up, they'll say, well, I, I you know, I've, I've seen people debating on Twitter about various uh, patristic theological terms. I don't know what these term mean terms mean. When I ask my priests, they don't know a lot about this. So who am I supposed to go to? I don't know who to go to. Do you see you see how the quandary uh, arises? Yeah. Well, and, and it's been a problem historically because when, when the priesthood has lacked education, there's definitely a trickle-down effect with the laity, right? Because they can only preach at a certain level or they can only answer questions at a certain level. And, and that's not good, right? I mean, a priest, in order to minister to somebody, has to minister to the whole person, including their mind. Right. Um, and, and we, and we've seen that because you may have some village priest who's very pious, but he doesn't understand the canons or some other aspect. And so you end up with, you know, somebody goes, well, my village priest blessed us to, you know, eat fish, all of nativity. And it's like, but that's not the church calendar. It's like, well, that's what he blessed us for. So that's what we're doing. And it's like, well, you know, God bless him. And he's probably holier than I am, but it doesn't mean that what he's doing is correct. Right. Like, we still have limitations and some of those limitations are based on that. We actually have to be scholarly in understanding what the text is saying there. And I don't want to get in deep dive into it, but there is some stuff that comes out of Mount Athos and I'm, and I'm serious when I say it's like, it's not scholarly. It, it, and I don't mean scholarly in the sense that like, there's some stuff that people say that I'm like, it just doesn't make sense. If you understand church fathers and other writings, like you can see that somebody's well-intentioned with what they're saying, but it doesn't add up. Like you, you actually have to be educated and read those church fathers and have a good breadth of knowledge. And it takes a long time. It doesn't, you, you can't read a bunch of church fathers in three years. Right. It's, just, it's an impossibility. Yeah. I mean, let me, let me give you an example because I think a lot of people that do the sort of the internet type of stuff that, that I do or that people that have encountered this stuff on the internet like Dr. Branson or, or Father Deacon Dr. Ananias or it's a very different experience than, than what you deal with obviously as a parish priest you know certainly and the, the problem is that let's say you've got a lot of Protestants or a lot of people coming out of Roman Catholicism and they've studied a lot of academic texts maybe they don't know a lot of the church fathers per se but they're looking at you know various anti-orthodox books or anti-orthodox polemics and so they've got a million questions and that it's sort of like there's this machine there, there's just 
on the internet, there's discussions of everything, whether it's appropriate or not. You've got all these people being confused. And so from my perspective, the reason that really good Orthodox academics are useful, you know, like Dr. Bradshaw, Dr. Branson, and there's others as well. I don't not mean to leave anybody out is that they can kind of go into the specifics of like the areas where things are unclear that it's not that a parish priest is, is it's just that they don't have time to go into reading, you know, five different uh, papers on what the word hypostasis means. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, sure. That's what I'm getting at here is that, that it seems from my vantage point that those people serve a function uh, that helps to where priests don't have that. And it seems like deacons have a lot more time to even do more theology than priests do. Well, it's, you'll appreciate this. You you did a you did a master's in philosophy, right? Uh, except for the thesis is not complete, so it's master's ABT, all but thesis. Okay, so I used to say about I've been in a lot of philosophy classes like you, right? I used to say in philosophy, there's three types of people in a philosophy class: the light bulb is on, the light bulb is flickering, and the light bulb is off, and it's never coming on. And the reality is, is like. Even priests have limitations, right? You may meet a priest who is more philosophically minded. I don't even know why philosophy is easy for me. It's just like, it's just, it's like, I hate to say it. That sounds pretentious. No, it it's, it comes, it comes natural to some people. I think that's true. Yeah. It's just, it's just like, a body. like singing or music. Yeah. Yeah. Singing doesn't come naturally to me. So like, you know, like. Uh, but I do think, yes, there's a, there's a place. Well, and I think within, you know, even as St. Paul says, there's those that are appointed to be teachers, right? I mean, that, that's a language that he uses. Yeah. So there's generalized, I would say teaching that I do in my homilies, which is more of an encouragement and has more to do with living the faith. And then there are, there are academics who are, uh, confirmed to have the the ability, both the intellectual. I mean, every priest doesn't have a hundred and thirty plus IQ. It is don't, and that's okay. That doesn't matter. I mean, it it just doesn't matter. The reality is, is you have to have a certain IQ level to understand this stuff. And and, and we talked about that with Saint Gregory Paul Moss. Saint Gregory Paul Moss was very obviously a genius. He was. He was a genius. He was also a real hesychast. So he was able to he was able to expound on things and write them. The same thing with Saint Sophronia of Essex. I think Saint Sophroni gets he doesn't get any shade, but he gets overlooked. And I'm like, Saint Sophroni's like the best that has ever come to us in the West. And in Saint Silwan, the Saint Silwan book, it's, it's like unmatched. I mean, that book is so incredible in its understanding of the of the Orthodox ethos. It's it's unreal. It's that's that book is is a masterpiece, a masterpiece. Saint Sophroni is what, but he was also what? He was also a genius. I mean, he was. He was a painter. He was an artist. But he's called the saint of the uncreated light because he he experienced the uncreated light so many times directly in his own life. So, anyways, there are people that are lay people that serve a function within the church. Absolutely, I agree. Like it just. That's their job. You and I talked about this last time, and I said, "That's I. I see that as being kind of your function in the church, which is there are people that come. They have, like you said, they have spent a lot of time theologically, and they need to know or be confirmed that orthodoxy is not a cult, that it's not weird, and that it can stand up to intellectual um, uh, uh, inspection." And so they do need to find people who are able to answer. Like my Greek priest, when I went to him, when I first came to the church, I went to him and I asked him questions about things. And he's like, listen, I was never Protestant. He's like, I have no idea what you're asking me. And then <laughs> yeah, he, said, right. he goes, go up to the converts up at the Antiochian church in Santa Barbara. He's like, they can follow. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's funny. He was, he, was, he was honest about it. You know, he's humble about it, you know? So... Yeah. So the norm then is is that there's this sort of accepted process by which a person becomes a true life coach, which is really a priest. 
And that's through the process of being kind of vetted, <coughs> being, um, you know, confessing to a confessor, the confessor seeing where you're coming from, seeing whether this desire, this motivation is a passing fad, whether you, you know, whether it's coming from the right place. Time kind of is typically what, you know, bears these things out. And then not just reading a lot, but making sure that, you know, this is the life that you're actually str trying to live, struggling to live, right? I mean, so, and, and you were saying something like the norm was in the past many years. We're talking about for priesthood here, not for a person to be converted, but for, so, so let me, let me ask, let me ask it this way. Let's say a person's a new convert. We have a lot of inquirers, catechumens, new converts. They say, but look, father, I've got, all these family members, they're Protestants, they're Roman Catholics, they're atheists. They're always asking me all these questions. Are you telling me that as a catechumen, a convert, I shouldn't reply and I shouldn't give them answers or like, how long do I need to, to do, you know, to be Orthodox before I can start, you know, because that's the, the common response that we get is that kind of a question. But you're saying that's different though, for a person who feels like I am called to priesthood, which should be, again, what, after many years, five years, would you say, of being Orthodox, you can start maybe asking that question if that's what you feel that you God might be leading you to. Or like, I know there's not a, I know there's not a formula of the years, but what I'm saying is, is that, you know, you've been Orthodox for a long time. We're dealing with a lot of people who are brand new and they've got a million questions and they're saying, well, what's right for me as a catechumen or a new convert? Yeah, so there's a, and I'll, if you want, I'll give you some of the parameters that I look for if I were to recommend somebody for the priesthood. So number one is I would want them to be, you know, we just put out a thing, our bishop just put out a thing that said basically he's not ordaining anyone to the diaconate that hasn't been Orthodox for at least six years. So that's our diocese wide policy, which is, I, I think, very wise and built off of a lot of, you know, history. What are the things I'm looking for? Number one, good spiritual life a person who loves to pray fast is you know very devoted in their heart to christ like has a real desire to know christ um it doesn't mean that they have to have mystical experience it's better if they don't it's better if they just are solid i just want grinders i don't want gurus i just want people who are grinders number two and this is especially important for men that they have a history of sexual purity that is absolutely like number two on the list. They have to have many years of sexual purity because number one, we're all always going to be tempted by that. Every single man is always going to be tempted by that. And two, if there's a weakness there, the devil's going to exploit it because everything becomes harder once you become a priest. It doesn't become easier. You know what I mean? So that's number two. Number three, and along with this, which is, do you have a healthy marriage? Does your wife love and respect you? I mean, these are like, but these are all St. Paul's criteria, right? Does your wife respect you? Does she love you? Does she honor you? Are you a good father? Are you a good provider? Are you spiritually mature? Are you a benefit to the parish? You know, do you come to the parish to help, to work, to serve, to give? You know what I mean? I, I just, the last thing we need are spiritual people. You know, if I see somebody with a 300 knot prayer rope, it's like, or a ponytail, save me from the ponytails like you know like it's larping it's larping like so, so many times like, well what if my ponytail has nothing to do with my orthodoxy because there, there was a guy that uh, called in and he said uh your beard isn't long enough so i'm questioning whether you're even a man and i was like I, you know what i'll affirm it like the, the my hair has nothing to do with being orthodox it was a request from jamie uh because she likes long hair and uh my beard is not very long, so I just I just conceded to the guy the other night. I was like, okay, I'm not Orthodox. Fine, I don't I don't have a very long beard, so I'm not Orthodox. So I'll take it. It's fine. I mean, what? Yeah. Uh, well, what? It, well, what, what's um? Yeah, I think that like it's when people start to identify the external. It's the externals being the uh, sign of like, oh, I'm really Orthodox. How do I know? Well, uh, I have a title in my name from a monastery that calls me this, or I have this, yeah. you know. Um, well, yeah. show up to church wearing all black yeah. with a 300 knot prayer rope a terrible beard that's like unkept and super long hair which you know lay people are not blessed to have long hair ponytails right like St. Paul says this in the early canons of the church right and it's like why because it's like it's it's not for men the priests are given it as an exception but even if you go back and look at the icons of like Chrysostom and Paul and others they all had short hair 
that was actually the norm. The the fat the, the thing today with long hair really comes more out of the Russian church or people who are like playing monastic, you know, like I'm wearing all black to every service. I can't wear any other colors. I, you know what I mean? I only listen to Orthodox chant in my car. I can't, you know what I mean? Like, <clears throat> I'll tell you a funny story. I was, uh, I got picked up, you know, Father Zachariah Lynch, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we were in seminary together. We, we would do construction together. Father Zachariah's a great guy. And he picked me up in his minivan and I get in and, and <laughs> the music starts like, doom, doom. And I'm like, oh, for who the bell tolls? Like, I thought it was Metallica. And then it was like, gospel deep boy. <laughs> it's like this chanting started. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I was like, I was like, <laughs> oh, like maybe we're listening to different things. <laughs> but I mean, the point is, is like, when orthodoxy becomes your identity, you know, that's where it's problematic. My identity is in Christ. He's a real person. He's a person. He's the God man. That's where my identity is. My identity is in being loved by Jesus Christ. That is what defines me. I am an Orthodox Christian. I am in the church. That is true. I am a priest. All of those are true. But my identity is that I'm loved by Christ. If I lose everything tomorrow, I'm still Christ. And that's all that matters. And and, and if we start to fix our eyes on the externals of like, and, and, and also like what I'm not, like when people are like, oh, I'm not Protestant. It's like, what kind of pretentiousness is that? You know, like, oh, I'm not Roman Catholic. It's like, I understand that they're heretical sex, but you don't define yourself by what you're not. You have to have a, a positive sense of who you are. You know what I mean? And, and, and we should have compassion. We should have compassion on those people, not, not pretentiousness. Like our, you know, like we're so much better than all of them. Like that, that's such nonsense. Anyways, like, is the church perfect? Yes. Are those heretical sex? Yes. Is pretentiousness a sin? Absolutely. You know, we should, we should, have, we, should yeah. have, we should have humility. Well, this is the message of the one that we have the reading of the Samaritan woman, right? Because the Samaritans were the schismatics and the Pharisees were like, well, I'm too good to help that person out. Um, you know, they're cursed because they're schismatics. And then the good Samaritan is the one who shows mercy, um, even though that person yeah. was, you know, outside of the fold. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of, a lot of people make, they'll say that it's showing mercy, that that means that we're supposed to be an ecumenist, right? Which is a perversion of the passage. It's like, no, it's not saying that you have to say that, well, we're all one true church and everything's the same. It's saying that, you know, if a Roman Catholic dude has his car stranded uh, down the road and, you know, I see he's got the papal stickers on his car or something and I'm going to drive by and just like, you know, ignore him. Right. I'm violating the very point of that of that parable. I'm going to I should help that guy, uh, even though he's a Roman Catholic, because that's what charity does. Yeah, we, we need to be, you know, we, we need to be humans. Like we need, we're created in the image of God. We're the most noble of all creation. We're, we're higher than the angels. You know, we should live up to that nobility and, and be noble in all that we do and, and the way that we carry ourselves and the way that we interact. And these are real people. I think that's the problem with the anonymity on Twitter is it, there's no, there's no real people. There's just a name or an icon or whatever. They're not real people. And it gives people the sense that they can just kind of crap on each other you know that they can just be hurtful or say rude things or just be flippant um it's it's very very toxic because it's like first off like you never talk to people like this in person mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you just don't and, and and why not it's like because you'd be ashamed they would look at you and you would be ashamed of yourself but people do this online because there's this barrier you know behind the screen where I don't have to take accountability for saying something horrendous to somebody else. And uh, so is, act, is that anonymity, maybe another red flag, because it's also a way for people who are actually malicious and do want to, you know, stop people from be, being orthodox. I mean, there are people who are out there that are doing that and they will sort of concoct things and they'll say things and they'll try to do, you know, subversive techniques and tactics to confuse people on purpose using a lot of anonymous profiles. 
I mean, I, I put it on my profile recently. I said, I think every Orthodox Christian should have their name on Twitter. And I think they should have their parish too. Because then it takes away, it takes away the get out of jail free card. You know, so if somebody's an a-hole, they can't, and I mean, forgive me, I'm just being honest, but like if somebody's being a jerk to somebody else, they can't just, oh, well, you'll never find me, or you don't know who I really am, or whatever else. Right. And and that's that's what I think I see is like, you know, people, especially, especially with men, they're they're like mad disrespectful to each other. And I, you know. All of the guys, I mean, I've known some some gnarly characters. Let's just say mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. You know, some homies that get a lot of time. Most respectful people you'll ever meet. Why? Because they know that if it goes south, they're going to have to stab you. And yeah, like, in the real world, you can't be <laughs> just randomly disrespectful without, I mean, because there's consequences to that. So this, it's right. it, allow, it allows this pseudo world the pseudo reality where people are kind of letting their nastiness come out because they're not they're not like you said not accountable and the excuse is well you're going to dox me well no saying where if you're going to be publicly trying to teach and tell people what orthodox theology is and this kind of stuff you have there's no such thing as doing that without being accountable right exactly there's none of that there's no self-appointed if you're doing it you're self-appointed you shouldn't be doing it anyways. And if you have to hide, like I don't get to hide as a priest, why would lay people get to hide? You know what I mean? Like why would they get to hide behind the anonymity and, and a lack of repercussions? Um, and, and, and I mean that because especially, especially you see this with the, with the, the males, which is like, it's, 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 um, it's a very catty feminine energy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know what I mean? They're like scratching each other and they're like shrieking and saying nasty, mean things to each other. It's like, listen, men don't talk like this. Real men don't articulate to each other in this manner. Because if you do that in person, it's going to get escalated. And we all know there's only one way to solve it once it gets escalated. That's why people hold their tongue when they're in person, you know, because they know that it's like it could go south. Um, that's not good. And, and it doesn't show the nobility of orthodoxy, you know, these, you know, kind of, uh, screeching, um, feminist energy, caddy, uh, you know, out the side of your mouth, passive aggressive comments. None of that is like, wow, orthodoxy is like, it's so manly. Like all the guys act like chicks. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and do you think that the root of that is probably multiple the culture in general um guys being feminized not having outlets like i know you're a big uh, weight you're into weightlifting you're a, you're a power lifter um guys are missing real masculinity in the culture ultimately and i think yeah and they're missing you know we don't really have brotherhoods you know we don't have brotherhood like yeah. my church i'm very blessed like we have a brotherhood we just went and blessed the waters it was like 40 degrees out, which is crazy for Texas, and then plus wind chill. But we probably had 15 guys jump in the cold water together, right? And everybody's, you know, doing this. It's like, why? Because it's like, we're men. It is part of being orthodox. We want to get in there. We want to challenge ourselves. Yeah. You know, we want to do something hard. I'm very blessed because I got a lot of guys at my church that are of, you know, a similar ethos in that regard. Um, and that's healthy. But, you know, yeah, there's certainly churches – uh, where the male atmosphere is lacking, to say the least. Uh, I, I think the big problem is the height of manliness is to love Christ, because that means you've overcome your inclinations as a man to deify yourself. Literally, the hardest thing for a man to do is to love Christ. Women are Women's spiritual baseline is so much higher than men, and women's inclination is so much more natural so we lose that idea when we think it's like manliness is something else. It's not. It's, it's, that's what it is. Manliness is loving Christ. If I meet a guy who's, you know, five foot eight, 125 pounds, and I have a sense he loves Christ, that's a man. Now I'm going to encourage him to gain 50 pounds because, you know, he's, if he wants to have a family, you know, he needs to be able to take care of and defend them. But the core there is manliness. And yeah. A lot of times in parishes, we're just 
we're missing good, strong brotherhoods. And, and that's the thing. What do men like to do? We like to do stuff together. You know, we don't need it. We don't need a book study. We don't need to hang out and talk about our feelings or something else. We need to renovate the church. We need to jackhammer up the floor. Yeah, we had a good time at my parish. All the guys just got together and basically uh, when we expanded the parish, all the guys just hung out by like moving all the stuff. <laughs> we, we took us like three hours to move stuff and it was like a guy time. Yeah, well, like, yeah, I mean, we've renovated like multiple aspects of our church all together as the brotherhood this Sunday, we're going to build a new cross out front. Um, so, I mean, but yeah, you got to have stuff. And then we go, like we do an a annual men's retreat where we go and we cook brisket and shoot guns and just hang out together and, 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 you know, shoot Tannerite and whatever else, like just being men together. We don't have to, I, I think there's a kind of this idea, like, it's all got to be, I, I don't know, like, you, you know what I mean? Emotionally bonding or something. Yeah, bond. yeah, exactly. Now, and this honest question, I'm not trying to, yeah, because some people will say, but don't the canons not allow for that kind of stuff? Like, what if somebody says priests can't shoot guns? And, I, and I'm not accusing you. I'm saying people will say these kinds of things like, oh, you can't do that as a priest. That's not, that's not allowable. What, what's the, what do you think about that? Well, technically the can I mean, yeah. So technically the cans don't say that the priest can't shoot guns. What the, what the canons say is that if you shoot somebody with the gun, mm -hmm. then you're not a priest anymore. But even that's a gray area. If you go to the Serbia, that's what I was going to ask because I've heard of stories where that doesn't, yeah, that doesn't line up. Well, the Serbians are crazy. So, and, and they don't, and they don't <laughs> say that because it's true. They're crazy. But I remember talking with a Serbian priest and I was like, father Roddy, I'm like, how is it? You know, when they had that internal, whatever, you know, war conflict, I'm like, how is it that the, that the Serbian priest fought? And he goes, well, we just figure if the other guy has a gun and you have a gun, it's equal. So he's like, oh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all the priests, they would shoot at people that were also shooting at them. And when it was all over, they put their guns down and then they went back to the priesthood. So... Yeah, but that's that's the Serbia. They're, they're they're marching to their own drum, you know. Well, that's another question that comes up a lot too, which is that one one mistake we've seen over the years, uh, just in my experience, the last five or six years, is that you'll get guys that convert. Um, maybe they're eighteen, nineteen, twenty. They're very, very super zealous, which in itself is not a bad thing. But then they'll start reading the rudder, and then they'll decide that it's their job to try to interpret the rudder and tell everybody what's what they're doing wrong misinterpreting ancient canons what's the problem with this why can't why can't a convert or a catechumen immediately start trying to uh, you know apply the canons yeah i mean really we only have strictly speaking we only have one person in the church who really can do that and we all know that's the ecumenical patriarch no i'm just kidding uh, we only have <laughs> no you're it's actually pope have, francis right he's the only one that can do it right yeah. We only have bishops. Bishops are the only one. They're the final authority on the canons. You know, now in practical day-to-day -day life, the application of the canons is often decided by the priests. Um, but they do that with the knowledge of what their bishop wants. And also, if they have a question, they have to defer to their bishop. You know, somebody comes to me and says, I want the exorcism prayers read over me. I have to have a blessing from the bishop. I have to go up the chain of command. Uh, so the idea that anybody other than the clergy is wielding the canons is complete nonsense. It's ludicrous. Yeah, it's ludicrous. It's insane. The, the canons are not written for laity. The canons are written as a guideline for church governance, Yeah, which right. is primarily the job of the bishop. And then in practicality, it's the job of the day-to-day -day working of the priest, who's his representative. The priest doesn't have his own priesthood, you know? He doesn't have it outside the bishop. And this is like, you know, we were talking to Father Deacon Ann Nice about this other day, and he was making the point that the approach to that is really just kind of a holdover of Protestant stuff. A lot of stuff is very Protestant because it's sort of like, you know, the Protestant idea is, well, it's me and the Bible ultimately at the end of the day. I might like my pastor or respect the pastor, but 
it's me and the Bible. And then when a person who's 18, 19, 20, when they get into orthodoxy, then the same attitude is just applied to, well, it's not just me and the Bible, it's me and also these other writings. And I'm going to apply those writings in this very sort of rigid fashion. But there's a lived wisdom and experience that's necessary to how the principles behind the letter of the law apply, right? And so we can always be susceptible to falling into that pharisaical attitude of thinking that this ancient canon about not attending a theater applies to, um, you know, whether or not you can go see a play that your sister's in down the road, right? I mean, I've yeah. actually, I've actually seen people going after priests literally for this kind of thing. Like somebody to, you know, uh, was going to, oh, you can't go to the theater because ancient canons say that, but they don't even understand the context of ancient theaters was like giving obeisance to pagan demons and gods to go to the theater. Modern theaters are not literally connected to worshiping. I mean, some of them might be <laughs> Broadway or something, I don't know, but you know what I mean? Like uh, you're going to see a play is not the same thing. No, and I mean, I, I think the thing is, is really what it is, it's, it's the modern delusion. It's a temptation. You know, everybody has a temptation and, and people have no proclivities. They'll get tempted to the right or to the left. And so obviously for some people, when they have zeal, the devil doesn't tempt them to the left because he can't get them. He That's a good point. To the right. So he says, hey, look at your priest. He's not as serious as you are. You're more serious. You know, you're in a better right. place spiritually. You understand. He doesn't understand this. He doesn't understand this. You understand this. All of this is egotism, right? I mean, again, I think so much of it just has to do with the fact that culturally with Protestantism, you're the center of the universe. And so you're constantly working out of that mindset. And uh, people don't realize, like, historically, you know, you know, you read like we referenced Father Roman Braga earlier. He talks about the fact that when he was a boy, when they went to the monastery, he's like, the monks there were holy. He's like, we were afraid of them. Intimidate is probably the better word, right? And he says, but it's because they were so holy. And that really was an understanding in village life uh, in Romania at the time was like, People understood that the clergy were really set apart. They had received something in their ordination. And so often today, people fail to realize, like, they may meet a priest <coughs> and, and they judge him for something or other. There was a debate, like, yesterday or last couple of days on Twitter about, would you trust a fat priest? And I don't want to get into all the nuance, but basically, in the writings of St. Silouan that people are obviously unaware of, St. Silouan says, even if a priest is found lacking or a bishop or has some proclivity for food, the grace of the Holy Spirit does not depart from them. That's what people don't understand is that these ordinations are not promotions. This is not a job. This is not a corporate structure. This is the mystical church. When somebody receives an ordination, even if they're unworthy, something happens to them and they are forever changed. And there are aspects to that ordination. I remember talking with another priest. And he said, he met a man at a church one time. And he said, from the minute that they started talking, he could see the grace of the priesthood was on the man. And he said to him, did you used to be a priest? He said, the man started crying. And he said, I, I was a priest because of some circumstances. I asked to be laicized, blah, 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 blah. But people don't understand that like, even, even you may take your whoever, whatever priest, they're still a priest. They still have the grace of ordination. And the other thing is too, this is what drives me crazy, is that people, like if you can't trust your priest, there's a saying, the man who has himself as a spiritual father has a fool for his spiritual son. If you can't trust your priest, if you can't be in obedience to him, and not obedience like he tells you what time to wake up and who to marry and all this, right? We're talking spiritual life and repentance. If you can't listen to him, then you are the spiritual father. You don't have a spiritual father. You don't have a priest. You are the priest, in which case you're an idiot. You know, you're better off leaving your parish and finding a priest that you can listen to. But if you go around and you can't listen to any of the priests, and I've seen this many times, guess what? It's like if you run into someone today and they're a jerk, they may be a jerk. But if you keep running into jerks all day long, you're the jerk. <laughs> you know, if you go to Orthodox Church and you go, man, 
that priest isn't holy enough and you go to four or five other parishes and all the priests, none of the priests are holy enough for you. Guess what? You're it's, just deluded. You're the problem. Yeah. Yeah. You're delusional. So in other words, it, you're recognizing the reality that, well, there are actually corrupt priests, right? I mean, there's bad, there's, there's people out there that sure. are right. But, and so, cause the person that hears what you were saying or initially would say, well, but wait a minute, you know, how can it always be my fault if there are corrupt priests? You're saying that if the pattern demonstrates that you can't find any spiritual father and, you know, you've gone to four or five different churches and everything's wrong with them, but not with you, then, then that's, that's what you're getting at here. That's just, I just, I'm just thinking this way because I know all the things that people are going to say because, you know, we have 10,000 people in the discord that are like, you know, 18 to 30. <laughs> so this is the stuff that I've heard for, you know, probably hundreds of times in the last five years. Even, even myself, when I became Orthodox, that I was the priest that I became Orthodox with. Was he a great saint or something else? No, he wasn't. Was he a solid, was he a, a uh, uh, what do you want to say? You know, your solid kind of everyday priest? Yes. Do I agree with him on everything? No. I don't. I'm in Rocor. He's in the GOA. You can figure out. <laughs> We're not going to see eye to eye on everything. But when I was with him, whatever he told me, I was obedient to. And I knew it because I had read St. Joseph the Hezekiah. St. Joseph said, it's not what you do. It's that you're obedient. So did I have the strictest fasting? No, I didn't. But was I obedient? Yes, I was obedient. You know, when he said, do this or do that, or you need to do this. I would do it. And guess what? The reality was the grace of God worked through it and moved me right in a, in a direction. In the direction that you needed to be. Yeah. I mean, I, I found that same thing. Like I persevered and eventually found a good spiritual father. I didn't find one right away. Like it took me a while. Um, you, may, you may go your whole life without finding a spiritual father. There was some saint that I read recently. It was elder. It was elder. Um, Oh, what's his name? Elder Thaddeus. I think he said something like, I've never had a spiritual father. He's a saint. He said, I never had a spiritual father. But I guarantee you, you read his book, he was obedient to everyone who was in charge of him this whole life. Having a spiritual father, that's a different conversation. That's that's rare. you know. But being obedient on our end and being humble is easy. I can guarantee you, when you go to your priest and you're fighting with your wife all the time, and then you go to your priest and you argue with him about, whatever what book you should be reading he's not wrong when he tells you stop trying to read mystical theology and go read a book by chrysostom on marriage because you're not going to go to hell because your theology is incomplete you're going to go to hell because you know you have <laughs> problems with your wife and he sees that and knows that and people often are trying to divorce like oh well i'm really into spiritual stuff i'm into this i'm into that it's like no you have bad relationships or you have bad character you know, that's not your problem. Your problem is not these things. But the delusion, right? The delusion of man is that he can't see himself clearly. And so he he downplays his weaknesses and upplays his strengths. And he's like, you don't understand, Father. I'm really smart. Well, you may be smart, but you're going to go to hell. Like, it, it's like, you need to listen. You need to listen. You need to repair relationships. You need to forgive people. Like, those are the things that a person actually has to work on in order to attain the kingdom of heaven. And so often, you know, that's that delusional thinking where I'm really the spiritual father, not the priest. I'm really the spiritual father because I'm constantly second guessing everything that he says. It's nonsense. It's it's and it's super dangerous. You know, if you can't listen to your priest, you got to go find another priest. You know, like you just do, because it's going to be danger for you to be guiding and directing your own soul or reading the saints and trying to direct your soul is even more dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, to a lot of people who are new to that idea, it's a little, it may sound different at, at first because maybe they're used to Protestant stuff or, you know, in the Roman Catholic world, confession is just very kind of mechanical. There's not really this notion of a spiritual father. I mean, they have the idea of a confessor, but it's still not like what we're talking about. What would you say to somebody who asks you about that and they say, you know, well, well, isn't that, are you, are you telling me to shut my brain off and just kind of become, uh, uh, cause you said you're against guruism, but it sounds like you're telling me to shut my brain off and just do whatever they say. And how do I know that, you know, it's not a corrupt person or something like that. Who's gonna, you know, cause you hear these kind of horror stories of people who had really bad experiences in Orthodox churches. I had one when I was coming in, 
Um, it almost turned me off. But so what's your advice to how do we balance out that kind of uh, tough yeah. dilemma there? I, I think number one is like a good spiritual father is going to direct you on prayer, fasting, and God willing your relationships. They're not going to talk about every entrance, every detail of your life, your job, this, that, uh, okay. uh, what car you should buy. That That's not normal. That's not healthy. That's number one. Number two is um, who is their spiritual father? That's I always ask that question. Who is the person's spiritual father? So, are you know, when you ask a priest, who's your spiritual father? Who do you confess to that they can tell you, oh, you know, I confess to so-and-so. That's another one that's very important. Number three, simple things like, do they have a good marriage? You know what I mean? Do they have a good marriage? Do they have a wife that loves and respects them? When you see the two of them together, is there harmony between the two of them? Is there love? Um, do you see other people? Do other people respect the priest, right? So, yeah, you're right. You can't just willy-nilly just trust every priest to the nth degree. But, you know, you should have a lot of, you should have, a, there should be a lot of uh, evidence there that they are normal, healthy individuals with normal, healthy relationships of their own. Um, and, and, you know, the, the real, I'll tell you this, the real spiritual people, they, they don't come across as being spiritual. They just don't, they just, they hide it. That's like, that's like the, the hallmark is like, they, they, they hide they don't talk about it. They don't, you know what I mean? Like, look at St. Porfirios. He wrote that whole book, Wounded by Love, and told the nuns, don't publish it until I die. You know, like, who was he? He was just a simple priest yeah. uh, in Athens. You know what I mean? He was, at a, he was in a church. He was in a, a church in the city. He was a city priest. And yet he was a great saint, a miracle worker. But he downplayed everything. So, um I always, you know, you want people who downplay and are, and are looking at the basics. You know, there's nothing that a priest should say to you that doesn't have a measure of just common sense, right? I mean, it shouldn't be like wackadoodle, like, okay, I want your prayer rule to be wake up at one in the morning, do Jesus prayer for two. I mean, that's crazy. Like, that doesn't make any sense. We have normal stuff in the church, morning and evening prayers. If I tell somebody something about their marriage, it's like, stop yelling at your wife, you know, like, yeah. like, like, and then what do you need to do as a husband? It should all be pretty common sense and straightforward and convicting, but without theatrics or, or woo woo miss, you know, yeah. mystagogy. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I thank you guys uh, super chatting there. I will split these with father Moses. As you guys know, AC says $20. Uh, and then he doesn't say anything. I'm just going to read a couple of these and I have another question for Father Moses. Andrew, $3. Um, this is for you. What is the difference in your uh, explanation or the, how would you describe the difference between Greek and Russian spirituality, for example? That's interesting. Um, well, like one example would be that when, when a priest is ordained in the Russian church, they're automatically a father confessor. Whereas in, in the Greek, you actually get ordained and then you're not a father confessor typically for several years. And then you're actually bestowed the ability to hear confession. I would say a lot of Russian spirituality, in my opinion, is very utilitarian. Like Russians are very good with rules. Um, it, it's like, it's just, it's kind of a lot of black and white like this is what we do you're russian this is what we do like uh whereas the greeks they seem to need more nuance and they also seem to need more motivation and they also seem to have uh a real proclivity for kind of elder worship i you know what i mean there's yeah, this, right seems to be part of their culture that they they're really into you know they're really into the elder thing as 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 I, I don't know like it's it's a it's an aspect whereas in russia it it it's a little different um you know russians tend to be kind of more romantic in just the way that they are even though they're very cold externally even that like the sobriety of russians 
it, it doesn't convey what's going on inside all the time, but they tend to be more serious and more somber. Well, they're from a, a darker culture, like light wise with more winter and more cold and just a very different temperament. You know, Greeks are dancing and wine and Mediterranean sun and food. They're just very different cultures. And I think they're different people. Yeah. So sometimes it yeah. probably reflects that as well. Um, one question I had, uh, and this will maybe be the last sort of official question that we'll go to the rest of the Super Chats, is um, what's the overall message to uh, inquirers, catechumens, young new converts? Because it seems like, and <clears throat> one thing I've heard you stress a lot is that the theology is fine as far as it goes, but really what is lacking is the, the healing. Like to be able to go out and talk about those things kind of has the presupposition that you've kind of been healed and something has already happened beyond just you were received into the church that there's some more, more to it than that. Is that the, the major, what would, what's the key thing you would say to the young guys that are converting out there and women? Lay, too? Yeah. Lay a solid foundation. Focus on getting rid of your passions. So like if you have a problem with pornography, masturbation, devote all of your time and energy to fighting against that that you have to build a solid foundation with your character in those ages, 18 to 23, especially. So what does a solid foundation look like? Morning and evening prayers, keeping the fast, staying physically fit. You don't have to be a power lifter. You don't have to be elite. It, none of that's important, but just being fit, being somebody who can do something, right? If somebody needs their tire change, you can do it. So just stay fit. You know, um, be a help, be a servant, be a servant at your church. Just tell your priest if you need something, right? Because you don't have any kids, you don't have a wife, you don't have children. Uh, tell your priest, if you need something done, you tell me. You need me to run something somewhere. You need me to take care of something, fix something at the church. I'm your guy. Just be a servant. That's the big one. Because people often think, you know, that there's like, um, you know, you're like ascending Mount Tabor at the beginning of your journey, and you're not. I, I was watching the best, probably the best jujitsu coach of all time, John Danaher, talking to somebody the other day. And he said, your whole job in jujitsu, basically for the first few years, is just to learn defense so that no one can impose their will on you. He goes, then... After that is like marked out, which that's is like five to six years. He goes, then we're going to teach you how to impose your will. And people forget, you know, you don't become a world-class anything without a solid foundation. So just prayers, fasting. If the church doors are open, you don't have a wife, you don't have kids, you don't have a commitment, you're in church, you're praying, you're just solid. And, 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 and the number one thing that is underestimated for people, I think, just as a principle in life, which is the grind sharpens the ax. You do not get razor sharp in anything by having Absolutely. some experience. You get sharp by the, mon like the mundane, repetitive behavior that forms the character of who you are as a man or as a woman. That's what you build your marriage on. And then you have kids and do all those things. It seems like, uh, you know, Father Deacon and I just made this point too, which was that a lot of what is the trap in our culture, even beyond spirituality, is the idea of shortcuts, the idea that you can have this um, like immediate thing, right? Like, for example, let's say, let's say studying philosophy, just as an example. A lot of people think, well, I can watch a bunch of YouTube videos and I can get the five minute, you know, two sentence tweet boil down and I, I'm a philosopher now. And it's like, no, I mean, if you, you know, there's a reason why, and I'm not saying college is the ideal, but the, re the reason that there's a structure to that is that like there's, a, there's things you need to go through to be, for example, educated. You need to be able to write a paper to argue the thesis. You need to be able to show that you've read the material I mean, all of these kinds of things are sort of like being, they're being tossed out in our society because the idea is via largely the internet. Now people think 
I don't need all of that. I can cut out all that. I can get the AI shortcut boiled down paragraph of what the book is about. And again, I'm not trying to make reading everything. I'm just using that as an example that no, 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 you can't, you can't make shortcuts on any of these things. And you're saying the same with spirituality, right? It's just, it's a hundred percent. It's every discipline is like this. It's one thing to read about Kant. It's another thing to read Kant. You know, when you struggle through a book that's challenging, there's a formation that happens. Perseverance. You know, you have to persevere. You have to question yourself deeply. You know, when you're when you're really wrestling with a philosophical problem, it's not a it's not an afternoon activity. You know, you're you are really deep diving into it, exposing your mind, your soul, everything to it and 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 taking it in. But when you're new, you're only taking it in in light of your experience. Whereas, like you said, even in philosophy, we have a progression, even when we study philosophy, so that we understand what the later philosophers were building on right. and even arguing against. That's why we teach it in that fashion, so that you can understand when you come to a three or 400 level course, oh, I get it. It's there, He's making an argument against you know, this, that, the other. And he's trying to take us somewhere new. I get it now because I have the whole story. But exactly. like you said, that's like three years. That's like three, four years of study. Nobody comes, you know, there's that saying of 10,000 hours, right? Which is yeah, which exactly. 10 years or whatever, right? Um, mastery. There's no way around it. It, it literally is just, it, it just is what it is. I mean, there's like, you know, if a guy comes to the gym and he benches, 200 pounds and he gets 30% better every year. Well, that means next year he's benching 230 pounds. You know how far he is from 400 pounds, like five or six more years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you about weightlifting as that's probably an even easier example than studying yeah. philosophy. I mean, like, you know, the easy shortcut, like, Oh, why don't I just take steroids and then I'll have to do all this stuff. Right. I mean, isn't that an easy example of bypassing yeah. like the normal, you know, hard work. Well, what's funny about that is that uh, what's it called? When we, when we look at like even the steroid thing, it only gives you a little boost. It only, it, it doesn't do everything. It doesn't make you a hundred percent stronger. That's not what it does. That's why these kids, they take them. They only last. It's so funny. The biggest difference between long-term athletes and short-term is the short-term guys take steroids, get a little bump, usually get a, a gang of of uh, side effects and other things that they weren't expecting because super hard on your endocrine system, depending on how much you take. And then all of a sudden, within a year or two, they're not even working out anymore. And it's so funny, but the guys who are real, like long-term athletes, it, it just isn't the same. Well, that's the thing that. with a lot of shortcuts, right? Like a lot of shortcuts don't actually give you the thing that you think you're getting from the shortcut. And I, you could say the same thing with like a spirituality shortcut, right? Like, oh, uh, you know, I just converted. I'm going to set up my Orthodox life coaching uh, grift. And then like five years later, you don't believe Orthodox anymore because, you know, you moved on to something else, right? And it's sad because it's, again, it's, 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 there's that saying from I, I I'm not a fan of Metropolitan Kalistos, okay? But he had he has one of the best quotes where he said, uh, when someone converts to orthodoxy, sometimes it sticks and sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And he goes, but when they convert to Jesus Christ, it always sticks. And I think people they convert to the the things in orthodoxy that they like. And Father Turbo and I often talk about this, but they're not converting to Christ. They don't love Christ. They don't love, uh -huh. them, but they love, but they love the religion. They love, you know what I mean? They love whatever. Like whatever. there's certain utilities that are opportunistic for them uh -huh. in this ethos. But the heart of the thing is they're like, yeah, I don't really, I'm not interested in like no, having, Je I'm not, I'm interested in having Jesus actually change me. Yeah. It, the, the heart is not, is not on Christ. It's like, you know, I like, I like the aesthetics of orthodoxy. I think it was Father Sarah from Rose who said something like, those who are enamored by the vestments and the smell of incense will be the first to go over to the Antichrist. Yeah. Right? So, like, people are given over to, and I see this as a priest, right? Like, people are given over to the aesthetics or the smell or the sounds or the, the 
whole orthodoxy is so solid. And it's like all of this, all of the church is a means by which we deepen our relationship with Christ. Or even and, like the, let's say, or the temptation of like a, a, a trad political movement. Oh, I'm a based, you know, right wing political guy. I like orthodoxy because there's men and there's beards. And I'm going to see that yeah. as a vehicle for my uh, based right wing trad movement. You see it a lot with the Nazi, you know, the white supremacist type people on, on Twitter. They're like, they're talking about race. And I'm like, you, do you not understand that there's no race? Like, do you not even understand the basic concept in St. Paul that like Christ came to mankind? He didn't come to the white race, like just basic, basic stuff. But yes, they're trying to keep, they're trying to keep their ideology and put a little thin veneer of orthodoxy over top of it. And they're like, oh, orthodoxy will be the glue that will bond us together. And it's like, orthodoxy is Christ. You're going to get burned out because all we got is Lord have mercies and, you know, let us complete our evening prayer to the Lord and then an hour and a half left of service, you know? <laughs> Byzantos yeah. sends a $5. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, if you're not there to pray, it gets repetitive. And it get you know, if you're not there for Christ, if you're not there to, 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 to be in communion with him, you're going to get burned out because that's all we have. I mean, we don't have anything else. We're not selling a product or an ideology or an idea. You know, that's not what we're, we're not, we're not marketing any of that stuff. Unfortunately, I think one of the things that drives me crazy is people are trying to market orthodoxy and it's like, orthodoxy is the path of deification. We have the saints. If, if you want to know why orthodoxy is real, read the saints. If the saints are real, orthodoxy is real. That's it. Because there's nothing in the saints that you're going to read about in Catholicism or Protestantism. They don't, they don't have any saints. Yeah. saints Seraphim of Prague. They just don't. It's not there. I mean, they've got weirdos like John of the Cross. <laughs> yeah. That, you know, like weirdos. Yeah, or like women carving things into their chest and stuff. Um, Byzantos, $5. Uh, how long would it take? How many seconds could uh, Father Moses whip Jay in a fight? Uh, very quick. I met Father Moses. He's a stout dude and uh i'm sure he would whip me pretty quick i the the few times i've been in fights uh i got beat up pretty hard by a, a, a big stout dude so stout dudes are usually pretty good at fighting so i'll put my money on father moses Sl slayed 50 dollars. glory to god thank you for these streams jay thank you uh father moses for your spiritual advice today thank you slade slade says again for ten dollars um what if I already had hair, a beard, and I was always wearing black before coming Orthodox? I think he's making a joke there, but uh, I don't think the I don't think Father Moses' point is that you can't wear black. I think he's saying like if you're choosing to wear these things to signify to everybody, oh, everyone look at me, I'm over here uh, praying, and look how uh, you know visually Orthodox I am, and look look at me praying on Twitter. This is that drives me crazy. People praying on Twitter publicly. It's just bizarre to me. It's, I mean, doesn't Jesus says, right? Sermon on the Mount. Don't go out there like the Pharisees on the corner, you know, oh, you know, with dirt on your face to show everybody that you're fasting. And forgive me, but I think it's even weird when people are like on Twitter, like, pray for me. I'm feeling sad. Yeah. It's like, it's like, what is like, I don't know. Like, it's just, I don't know. It's very strange to me. Like, bizarre. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, I, I don't know what that is. I don't know what, I, I mean, I gotta think about that, but it's like, like there's no decorum or uh, propriety, privacy. propriety, yeah. yeah. Propriety, like, like, okay, you're feeling sad. We all feel sad. I mean, that happens to all of us. Like, like, I don't know. Like, it'd be weird if I like texted my parish, like, hey, everybody, pray for me. I'm <laughs> all overwhelmed today. I mean, like, you know, like, it'd be weird. Like, I don't know. Anyways. It's, it's the spiritual life is internal and people are making it an external show. There we go. That's it. Performative. It's a performative thing. It's performative. And it's like, yeah, oh, I'm being vulnerable. Somebody posted recently on Twitter, like, I'm weeping a lot when I pray. And I was like, well, those tears are going to stop because the grace of the Holy Spirit, like, doesn't, doesn't, you, you know, doesn't come with showboating. Exactly. Or, 
proclamation or like then maybe that person had some real taste of grace but i'm like it's gonna end because everything that the holy spirit does is very modest and and, and hidden and secret and internal it's not yeah it's a still it's that still small voice it's not like the thunder and the lightning and the explosions right yeah even a priest i mean even even a priest technically is like not supposed to weep when you're serving like and he's not supposed to like does it ever happen? Maybe. But the point is, is like, you're supposed to keep your spiritual life hidden. Mm-hmm. You don't only keep, keep it hidden. Yeah, it's, 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 it's no different than like giving alms so that you see everybody. You yeah. know. I mean, I, it'd, be, it'd be like, remember that, uh, remember Ed McMahon, the publisher's clearinghouse, he would come with a big giant check. Right. Imagine like bringing that into the church and like you go up to the offering, uh, uh, the, the tithe and you put, the, like... well, like you go to the church where they have an icon, it'll be like donated by, you know, the Smith family. Yeah. And you're like, wow, it's like, it's on the icon. It's like, it's like, well, I don't need to know that. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Like, it's yeah. A, yeah, it's not, it's, or there's, uh, <clears throat> there's churches where they'll like paint the donors. Like in iconographic form without the halo. Oh wow, I didn't know that. I've seen that before. Again, it's like super weird. Like you're like in the narthex, so when you come in, it's like they're there. <laughs> it just yeah, that's off. odd. Living Orthodox. Uh, shout out to Father Mikhail. Uh, he has a great channel. Two dollars twenty two cents. Thank you for this talk, Father Moses and Jay. Uh, the love of Christ is hard to attain. However, it is the manliest thing that a man can do. I will share this video of my parishioners here in Alberta, Canada. Thank you very much, Father Mikhail. American Squidward, a dollar. This is a great stream. God bless you both. What's the best book you ever read in your entire life? Well, for me, the Bible is, I mean, even though that might not be appropriate. <laughs> I mean, that sounds Protestant. The Bible is still, to me, the most uh, effective in the history of my whole life. Um, so for me, the Bible, do you have a, a really important book for you, Father Moses? Now I feel bad if I don't say the Bible, man. No, I mean, it could be anything. <laughs> eat, pray, love. Is it eat, pray, love? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say the book that probably had the biggest impact on me was, uh, was the original, uh, Elder Joseph, the Hezekiah's book written by Elder Joseph of Atopetti. Um, it's a, it's a white cover. They reprinted it recently. I could show you it, but that book just, I don't know. There's just so much about that book. And, and I think too, like you have nostalgia and you have things that you read at a certain time and that book yeah. had a profound impact on me. And so let me ask you this, Jay. Yeah. Of equal importance. What's your favorite James Bond movie? Um, that, you know, they all have unique kind of elements of revelation about how things really happen. I, I, I mean, they're all kind of in the same domain of goofy, but revelatory. I think as movies, as like productions, um, you know, the first uh, couple James, uh, uh, Sean Connery uh, installments are really good. And I think the Daniel Craig ones overall were, were just as movies are really good. But for the most part, like all the Roger Moore ones are really stupid. Um so yeah, I don't really have a favorite one, but I think maybe the most revelatory for, you know, how corrupt supra international organizations work would be probably something like maybe Spectre or something like that. Um, the Daniel Craig one. Um, good question. Screeching Goobler, $3. Uh, hello gentlemen. What advice would you give about how bold we should be when another person brings up a question relating to spiritual advice? Specifically in the case that we are in danger of causing them here spiritual harm. So I, I'll, I'll just let you answer that. What happens if we have neighbors, friends, family that ask us as laity for spiritual advice? What's the most uh, appropriate way to go about that? Yeah, I mean, hold on a second. Somebody tripped the fire alarm in my house. So there we go. And this is like once. I think this went off yesterday too. It's uh, cooking. Um the uh i mean i always i just reference people to go talk to the priest you know like i yeah. uh i i see that i see that that uh ask orthodox a question or whatever on on facebook there's a group on there and it's like 
just it's all lay people giving five different opinions on stuff and you're like just go talk to a priest yeah i don't know why 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 does everybody why do all the lady want to give spiritual advice i don't get is it I don't know, maybe it's a it's a way to feel like oh this is what I it, it, is it just in a delusion or a, a, a spiritual immaturity like why is everybody wanting to do I don't even understand what the desire is to like you got young guys that go on Twitter and they're they're telling uh, married couples like what is appropriate in the bedroom via ancient canons and it's like this is just crazy to me. Yeah, I mean I think I think you hit the nail on the head. I think it's a lot of delusion like people trying to police it's policing. And that's, what's weird about it is like, you, you know what I mean? You're not, you're not a police officer. Like, uh, yes, that's where it gets really weird. Uh, and I, and I, I think it, I think it just boils down to delusion. Yeah. So it's that, it's that attitude of like, I guess, like you were saying, like in the modern American Protestant landscape, the idea is that everybody can be and do anything that they want and there's some sort of shortcut course, you know, uh, guru course that you can take to get to that objective on your own, you know, with two monthly installments of $60 for life coaching classes. Then you become the life coach. Then you become the, you know, it's like everything is that weird shortcut in, in our society and especially via the Internet. Um, well, and also, I mean, I think people like they'll have an answer from their priest. And they'll go, oh, my priest says this. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So everybody needs to know that, you know, it's like somebody says, I don't know, can I drink whey protein during Lent? It's like my priest says absolutely not. Yeah. And it's like, you know, you may be 20 years old and and work a job and are fine. I may have somebody who comes to me who's 30 is like, Father, I can't afford vegan protein. I may bless him. Two different people. It's not because I think whey protein is is acceptable during Lent. I just may have a situation where I got to work with somebody. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And right. so it's a, it's a completely different. You know, our advice is very. Um, it's not generic, and I think that's the problem too. Is everybody thinks it's like a one size fits yeah, all. Yeah, one size fits all. Awesome. Yeah. Seattle, uh, Jmail, fifty dollars. Thank you so much. Seattle is a very tough town, spiritually speaking. I would like to shout out Father Fodios Dumont of the St. Dimitri Parish, Abbot Trifon, in this city. They are theologians and Father Confessors. If you are looking for someone, we are very blessed to have them here. Thank you for that, JML. Appreciate that. Banjo, $10. How would you respond to evangelicals who have these unwitting uh, delusions? They're constantly ascribing meaningful things their messages uh, from God to their dreams, their events in their life. Everything is about uh, prophecy and times, this kind of stuff. What would you say about the evangelical tendency towards those kinds of delusions? It's hard, hard to get somebody out of it, especially because I don't know. I used to be evangelical, right? So like, what's the number one thing is somebody goes, I feel right. So there's this, there's this nebulous sense. There's nothing concrete. Ironically, the Holy spirit always agrees with you. So it's like, man, <laughs> right, I, yeah. I, you know, it's like, it's like the lotto numbers are correct 100% <laughs> yeah. of the time. Um, it's hard. I mean, that's the sort of stuff I would talk to somebody about is like, do you ever feel the Holy Spirit disagreeing with you? Like maybe just even take an approach like that. Yeah. In my experience, we're told not to trust our feelings. How about that? You, just, you, give, you give somebody a, a counter view. Yeah. Like we're, we're yeah, like ask the question, like, well, how, how would you know when it's the Holy Spirit or when it might be you or your deceptive, you know, inclinations? What if you eat too much Kung Pao chicken and it's just indigestion? How do you know it's not the indigestion? <laughs> right. not, you know what I mean? Well, I mean, yeah, like what you what you eat, that can give you really weird dreams, right? I get really, like if I eat popcorn, I don't eat popcorn very much. But if I do, I get a really weird dream at night. So like, I wouldn't conclude that, oh, that's God speaking to me in the dream because I eat popcorn. You know, it's more likely the popcorn. Justin, $20. This is always great to hear from Father Moses. Uh, thank you, Justin. Chase Haggard, $3. Thank you, Father Moses. Do you think that it is a red flag if a lay person tries to teach without any clerical oversight or accountability? For example, I see many people online saying crazy things. And then when asked about their blessing to teach, 
They don't really typically respond. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, we've talked about this a number of times, but yeah, I mean, it's a huge red flag. I mean, again, remember, most blessing is from the bishop. It, for a ministry to exist, it should have a bishop. I mean, I know that like Father Ananias is really good about that. He's got a whole board that's all priests. Um, you know, you, you got to have oversight from the clergy. But yes, I mean, everybody, somebody on Twitter who has, you know, 15,000 followers is calling all the bishops to repentance and that we all need to unify and create one jurisdiction or something. Yeah. And it's like, there's no nuance. It's who, I mean, there, I could just talk about that for 30 minutes, but yeah, that type of hard, these people with hard opinions, no experience, unordained, a lot of times not even married. Like they don't even know what it's like to be married. Right. Even have kids. Um, oh, we're literally talking about like 22, 23 year old guys on Twitter that just post hot takes. Yeah. I just, you know, I mean, I just stay away from all that nonsense. I mean, it's just, I don't know. You get older and then you stop caring as much. It's just like, whatever. So, I mean, one of the things I realize is a lot of people are like, why are more priests active on Twitter, whatever else? It's like, cause they're doing stuff. Yeah. Right. Well, you know what I mean? Like they have wives and children and sometimes they even have a job or they have a bunch of parishioners. Like they don't have time to post 30 times a day on Twitter. Like yeah. if somebody has so much time, unless it's their job. They got nothing else going on. Something's like, weird. Yeah, something's off. Like, <laughs> yeah. Brett Sales, $10. I was Protestant for 30 plus years. One thing I never knew I needed was an actual holy space, like physical space. When I'm in the temple uh, and the doors are open, I wouldn't have found it in any other way. Yeah, that's an interesting point too. It's like in Protestantism, everything's equalized. And you don't have this notion of like holy things, places, spaces. And that means there's boundaries. There's lines and delineations, limitations. And that means that a laity person, a lay person is not equal to a priest, right? There's, there's barriers here for good reason. Even in our house, like we don't put icons in the bathrooms. Uh, great. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We don't, when we bless the house, we don't sprinkle the bathrooms with holy water. Like, and, and when you go to a house that has an icon corner, which is a separate place. You may have icons in every room of the house. I probably have an icon in every room of my house, you know, but I only really have two icon corners. Um, yeah. And they don't get used for anything else. Even the definition of holy just means to be set apart. Set apart. Yeah. Ultra $3.60. Uh, thank you. Great stream. I've been struggling with very heavy PTSD this kind of uh, conversation helps me move forward. Um, yeah, that's great. I don't know a lot about PTSD. Uh, Father Moses, I don't know if you have any insight on that. I, got too, I have too much personal experience with it. Uh, <laughs> well, then you're the, yeah. you're the perfect person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, if you struggle with PTSD, I, I recommend. You know, I don't always say this, but like, really, you got to try to find somebody who's gone through some stuff and is able to kind of guide you and talk to you and your and you know your 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 normal parish priest is going to be able to help you to degrees but you may need more intensive a more intensive with a more intense spiritual father in order to get help with that it, it's just a reality it's like it's like um you know, you have a you have a, a general doctor, and then you have surgeons. And if you have brain cancer, you need a surgeon. So yeah, yeah, that's what that's what I would recommend is try to find somebody who can really guide and direct you with prayer and fasting on on how to overcome um, those thoughts and 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 to be separated from the thoughts. So uh, yeah, truly, God's son, five dollars. I come from a non-denominational Christian and Protestant background. Uh, I've been visiting an Orthodox church for the last few weeks. I am unsure if I'm missing a feeling uh, in the presence of the Holy Spirit during the liturgy. Um, should I be expecting feelings, I think is what the person's asking. No. It's a lot better if you don't. It's really good. It's really good to just show up and pray and just be present. And uh, I was talking with the Anglican priest about this recently. 
And I told him I never felt I was called to orthodoxy. I had a, I had a, I had a, I, God allowed me to struggle through all the questions that I had. And I didn't have, there was nothing magical about it. So if you show up and you're like, I'm not really feeling anything. It's like, that's fine. Just hang out, just be there, just be present. You'll just start to realize things slowly. Like, wow, I can hear myself think in the liturgy and it's quiet and there's something different going on. Um, One of the starkest contrasts I learned about the liturgy was when I first started going to liturgy for a while, I had to go visit some family and we went with them to their church, which was an evangelical church. At the time, we were not technically catechumen or anything. We were just going to Orthodox services. Um, and I remember being in there and I was like, you can't pray in here. I never realized that before. I, it's just too loud. It's a cacophony of noises. It's this. I ended up walking out of the service. I was like, who can pray here? But mm-hmm. I didn't know. I only knew it because I had been going to Orthodox church for a period of time. So I would say just hunker down and give it some time and just, you'll be fine. LH, $10. I'm a current catechumen at St. Elias Orthodox Church in Austin. I would love to come visit your church. I don't know if you want to tell people where you're at or or if you, I mean. Oh, yeah. So we're in Georgetown, Texas. We're just north of Austin. So more than welcome, if you're a catechumen, more than welcome to come visit. We have vigil on on, uh, Saturday nights at 5 and liturgy on Sunday mornings at 9.30. And then if you check our schedule, we usually basically have one weekday liturgy every week as, as well. Typically Fridays this week we had today because of St. Zenia. But yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, uh, Father Moses McPherson. I appreciate you coming on. Um, anything you want to leave us with before we close it out? Oh, man, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. And everybody be sure and support. Do you want people following your Twitter? Or, I mean, I don't know if you do. Or people are different about that. Um, I, mean, I don't know. Yeah. I'm on, I'm on, uh, let's think of, I'm on Instagram as McPherson Barbell, which is just me lifting weights. Nothing, nothing spiritual. You look like Eddie Hall, by the way, you were talking about Eddie Hall and I was like, actually, you look like Eddie Hall. <laughs> well, a little bit. Yeah. There's a similarity. We all just have bloated faces, you know, like once you get to a certain size, it's like, it starts growing your face and you gotta, you just enjoy it. Um, I showed somebody a picture the other day, like from 10 years ago. They were like, man, it doesn't even look like your face. <laughs> a lot skinnier then. Um, and then on, uh, what was I going to say? On I tried Twitter, to find you on Twitter and I couldn't find the profile, uh, but I'll add it to the show description. So people, if they want to, they can follow you on there as well. Yeah. Twitter. It's, it's like father Moses, Texas or something like okay, that. Okay. And then you can, my YouTube channel has all my homilies. That's probably the, the, the place, place where the biggest resource. Oh, okay. I didn't even know you were on YouTube. I'll find that as well. Okay. Yeah, I'll link that below. Everybody can uh, follow his uh, his stuff on, on social media. Thank you again, Father Moses.